good evening. Uh, welcome everyone to the Sustainability Grand Tour. Um, I'm William Finnegan. I'm the chairperson of the West Region uh, of Engineers Ireland. And tonight we're delighted to welcome Brian Ledden, uh, who is chair of the Oireachtas Climate Committee and TD uh, to speak to us about the government's Climate Action Bill. Uh, tonight will be the sixth part of the Sustainability Grand Tour. Um, and so the Sustainability Grand Tour is a seminar series uh, that began in January and it's uh, promised to continue until the end of April. Uh, within the tour, or we're, or we're hoping uh, to run a seminar series which aims to demonstrate how engineers can integrate sustainability into their projects at all stages from the from the design to the end of life. Um, it'll also give engineers an opportunity to explore how their role uh, will help in developing a more sustainable cities, communities, and life for us all. Um, to date, we've had five very successful uh, seminars uh, with a further 11 scheduled um, tonight. Brian Ledden is going to talk about the government's Climate Action Bill. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Brian and he can take away. Okay, thanks, William. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. That's... Okay. So I'm just going to share my screen and we'll get the presentation going. Can you see that? Yeah, that's good, Brian. Okay. Um, that's me there, Brian Ledden. Uh, I'm a TD for Limerick City uh, and I'm the Green Party spokesperson on climate. And it's not changing. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, just to, I suppose by way of background to give you a sense of who I am and why I'm here. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. I studied in in UL back in, uh, well, I enrolled in the last century and I finished in this one. Um, and that was my career uh, until quite recently. Um, so I, I did, did mechanical engineering. I, I did a master's in renewable energy systems technology over in the UK in Loughborough University. Um, and I was working then in Limerick uh, for a consultancy firm um after i finished my master's and uh, and a different consultancy firm more, more recently so um the uh, i suppose i'm what might be described as a reluctant politician i uh, didn't see this as my path at all uh, but outside of my work i got involved in things locally in Limerick, uh, like the, the cycling campaign which i founded and also I resurrected the Limerick branch of Antashka and I think when you're involved in these extracurricular things and you know people start asking you you know would you would you not stand in the local elections and I was asked in 2014 and I thought it was a ridiculous idea and so I didn't uh, and then I was asked over the next few years again and uh, just to put the question to bed I suppose I agreed to stand in 2019 to, to the uh, uh, local council in Limerick. Now Limerick had never elected a Green Party politician ever, so I, I, I thought you know this was just going to, um, you know, be a way of getting people to stop nagging me. But uh, I got elected, <laughs> so and um, life life changed pretty much um, as soon as the local elections happened. Um, there was talk of a general election and. There weren't that many candidates, green candidates to choose from. So en I ended up being candidate for the, the general election last year. Uh, and lo and behold, I got elected to that. Um, I got elected to the Dal 12 months ago. Um, uh, and uh, and then I, I, I finished up with the engineering then. Um, so uh, I've been in the Dal since February of 2020. Uh, Eamon Ryan made me the Green Party spokesperson on climate, uh, which is a huge honour uh, because it's such a core uh, pillar for of the party. And um, uh, and I found myself in, in the last 
six or seven months since we've been in government, essentially shadowing Eamon Ryan because he's the Minister for uh, Climate and also the Minister, Minister for Transport. So uh, everything he's doing is, is uh, relevant to my brief. Uh, and then I was appointed as chair of the Joint Directors Committee on Climate Action in September. So um, that's been keeping me busy for the last few months. And um, I'll move on. So I suppose just to put it out there, you know, engineers, we, there aren't that many engineers in politics. And um, I remember when I said to my boss um, in Limerick that I was going to put my name forward for election. Um, he couldn't have been more supportive. Uh, and he made the point, he said, you know, we, we need more engineers in, in politics. And if only we did have more engineers, in politics, then maybe society would be different, you know. And um, so he was fully supportive. Uh, and whatever he thought about me, I was probably as much a reluctant engineer as I was a reluctant politician. But um, he really encouraged me, and uh, and the company did. And um, uh, and I don't think without their support, I would have been elected. Um, interestingly, I was speaking with a colleague. Um, who worked in China, did a huge amount of uh, structural engineering work in, in cities in China, and he, he has his name to a number of skyscrapers in Beijing and Shanghai and all over. And um, he told me that in China, it's the very opposite situation. When he was there, it was a national scandal that uh, the first non-engineer was uh, appointed to the Politburo. So that's the, the other extreme completely. And uh, I'm not sure we necessarily want to go there, but maybe there's a, um, some kind of happy medium where uh, engineers would contribute more to the world of politics. Uh, I think it would be positive simply because we look at things differently. We're, we're very solution oriented. We're, we're, we're very committed to the evidence-based approach and we don't uh, accept solutions unless there's very solid uh, supporting uh, evidence for those. Uh, and that's not something that is really uh, true of politics generally. You know, so I do think um, if we had more engineers, you know, if we could figure out a way to get more in engineers into politics, I think it would be a good thing. OK, um, so go on. So here's some headlines which you're probably quite familiar with. Um, so Ireland has been struggling a bit on the uh, climate front for a while. We, we haven't really taken it seriously until the last few years. Um, so we're coming from behind. And um, our ambition, by the way, at the minute is, is really big. You know, we're, we hope to cut emissions by more than 50% within 10 years, you know, that's, a, that's a, a commitment that the three parties in government have signed up to. So we're going from, the plan is to come from the very back of the class to the very, very front. Uh, and I think with the climate bill, we will. Um, and we're doing this for the right reasons. You know, the, the crisis is serious. It's, it is ex existential. Um, it's going to have a profound effect on uh, society across all countries you know no one's going to get away um cleanly out of this um that headline there just the bottom right the moral clarity of young people um you know just reminded of on the election day i met a um a very elderly woman who i knew was a diehard supporter of another party and and i chatted with her and uh, knowing that she wasn't uh, going to vote for me, but I, I was happy to chat anyway. And then she said, she said she was going to vote for me. And she pointed over to her granddaughter who was sitting in the car. And she said, I'm doing it for her um, because her future is, is at stake and it's at risk. Um, and I thought that was quite, um, quite significant for somebody who was so political. Uh, and linked to a, a different party, which is really quite a different agenda, um, you know, would choose to support mine. And 
and it just hit home that you know everybody accepts now how serious this issue is and and we have to find our way out of it you know and um and it really it's going to fall to engineers for the most part um and it's linked to the idea that perhaps there should be more engineers in politics because uh we are good at solutions you know we're we often don't get the credit for the work that we do um thousands and thousands of engineers across Ireland are doing amazing work uh, at pushing the boundaries of what's possible. Um, you might have seen there a few days ago that uh, two thirds of Ireland's energy was generated from renewables in the previous 24 hours. Um, I remember when I was in, in England in college and doing my master's, it was felt that 20% was the almost the theoretical maximum of variable renewables on the grid. And um, they were actually citing an Irish study, even though I was in college in the UK, they looked to Ireland as world leaders at that time in grid um, development. Um, and they were right, and we still are world leaders at grid development. Uh, but those people, those I think unsung heroes in the likes of Airgrid and ESP and, and in the uh, renewables and energy industry uh, are the ones who are the unsung heroes of climate action. They're breaking new ground every day and we need them to continue to break new ground uh, for the next few decades uh, if we're to get ourselves out of this crisis. So many of you may have seen something like this before. It's uh, um, a flowchart essentially showing where our emissions are coming from what areas and um, uh, and ultimately what the end use is. And I think for each, if you look at the right of the screen there and see all those, I know the text is quite small, but um, each one of those can be bro broken down much further uh, into um, very specific challenges that we need to resolve. Uh, so you'd see that, um, the, I mean, the methane obviously is a huge issue. Obviously, that's related to agriculture. Um, and then CO2 generally is energy generation, manufacturing, heating for homes. Uh, and the big one there, obviously, is transport. Uh, and the big chunk of transport is, is private cars. Um, so we'll come back to some of these shortly, I think. Yeah, so here's it in numbers. Um, these are 2020 figures. Um, so you have to kind of take these with a pinch of salt because they, they uh, reflect the upheaval of the pandemic. Um, but broadly, more than a third of our greenhouse gas emissions are from agriculture and about a fifth are from transport. Uh, then. Uh, the energy industry has put 15% and residential down. Add all those up, I think it's um, up to 80% or thereabouts. So that's those top four are the big, big ones. And um, these are the ones that we really need to get stuck into. And I think there's a role for engineers in all of those sectors. Um, uh, and I'll keep going. So there's agriculture. Um, I sit on the agriculture committee in the Oireachtas as well, and it's an education. Um, I certainly didn't know too much about it before. I was uh, appointed to it back in September, but there's some very diligent members of that committee who are generally aligned with the agricultural sector. So while they might not be so interested in climate, I'm certainly learning um, to from them and seeing their perspective. But you can see there that the dairy stuff is the big one. Um, so nearly 50% of our emissions are from dairy. Um, so we have to figure out a way of maintaining incomes and uh, while reducing emissions. Uh, and as you can see there, that's, you know, the objective really should be to focus on quality rather than volume. And that's, I think, the challenge in agriculture. Um, so, uh, I will keep going. So transport, it's about a fifth of emissions. A lot of those are private car. 
um, how we get that down in, in the next decade is going to be really challenging. Electric vehicles are not the the ultimate solution. Uh, it's impossible. It's going to be impossible to uh, transition fully to electric in that time frame anyway. But the best practice tells us that the priority approach should be avoid shift and then improve. And avoid is really to reduce the need for uh, transport to begin with. So that's about getting your transport and your spatial planning right. Uh, putting houses and uh, workplaces and inter industries and so on in the right places so that people don't have a significant transport need. And we've been really, really bad at that in Ireland uh, over the last 40 years. Uh, and we need to turn it around. Uh, National Planning Framework, which was published in 2017, will guide a lot of that work. But we probably need to go a bit further than the National Planning Framework. Um, Shift then is about modal shifts. It's about those journeys that would, would still happen in a better planned world. Um, can a lot of those be done by, by sustainable modes, uh, such as public transport and active travel, uh, and that that approach should be the second priority of, uh, of solving the problem, then improve then is those residual journeys, you know, that's where the electric vehicles come in that you would transition from uh, a fossil fleet essentially to a cleaner energy fleet uh, via uh, electric vehicles and battery electric vehicles as well. So you can see there an interesting figure is the pandemic, despite the fact that we were all locked in our houses and uh, um, not really driving around a whole lot. There was just a uh, two megaton reduction in transport emissions. So it gives you a sense of the scale of the challenge that we have to, to get that. We're going to have to reduce, like it was 12 megatons in 2019. Uh, that's probably the more real figure. And we've got to reduce that by at least 50%. Uh, so down to probably four or five megatons by 2030. Um, and we've got to do it using that avoid, shift, improve approach. So. Okay, uh, the energy stuff is, is quite positive from Ireland's point of view. We've been really good in this area. The picture there in the top is Money Point built in the early 80s. At one point it was supplying about, I think, 25% of Ireland's uh, electricity, um, but it was a and it, it was a big polluter. Now it, it's been uh, essentially on standby for the last uh, while, so it's not emitting. But um, and then down at the bottom there, you have the Arklow Bank wind farm. When I was in university in England in 2002, this was being developed, uh, and at the time I remember thinking we're going to go offshore really, really quickly because I think we actually had an offshore wind farm before the UK had. And um, and now, like, we, we still don't have any offshore, any more offshore, and the UK is really, really surged ahead. Uh, so the challenge for us now is to catch up and go a lot further because we have scope to go a lot further. If you, The problem for government commitment is uh, to... Uh, Developed five gigawatts of wind, offshore wind off the uh, east and south coasts by 2030. Uh, but we're pitching this vision of uh, trying to harness the 70 gigawatts or so that is available off the west coast. And that would be using floating wind technology, much bigger wind turbines, um, and much cleaner, less turbulent air, uh, and uh, much bigger output. And then question becomes, you know, what do you do with that power? So um, with interconnection, obviously, you can you can try and uh, export your excess to the UK and, and, and Europe, um, but a lot of interconnection would be needed. Um, hydrogen is a big talking point at the minute. Do you convert your, your excess uh, with electricity generated via wind into hydrogen? And then it's essentially stored and you can use that 
uh, for um, for transport, for industry, uh, for an energy generation uh, whenever you need it as well. So that's something that is is uh, coming along in a big way, and we're we're trying to push it and we're trying to signal that Ireland wants to be at the very very front of the hydrogen race uh, and uh, other forms of storage as well such as battery storage. There's some interesting projects going on in that area too. So, and it, the interesting thing about the electricity stuff is transport and heating is going to become electrified in the next uh, decade, two decades. So our the requirement for generating electricity is going to really, really surge. Um, uh, and, we can do this with renewables, you know, we can we can provide all the power that we currently need with renewables and all those cars that are driving around or um, the trains, the trucks, uh, the homes that we're heating will all be powered by renewables. And that's quite an exciting future. So, so there, this is the residential sector. The image there at the bottom is the first passive certified passive house um, retrofit uh, in Ireland and it's in Galway and I think it was 2015 that was uh, that was uh, renovated so it's a glimpse of the future the plan the government's plan is to retrofit half a million homes by 2030 to at least be two standard realistically many of them will be a standard uh, and that's a, a huge problem later in the year the National Retrofit Program uh, will be published. Um, fundamentally, the challenge there is to insulate, insulate, and insulate, and, and then with whatever residual energy demand you you um, try and meet with uh, renewables and uh, heat pumps as well. Um, the rooftop rooftop PV you may have seen recently. We've launched the consultation on microgeneration. So, come July of this year small producers of electricity will be able to sell their excess back to the grid. So the consultation is on at the minute and um, it's the it's tomorrow it closes. So if you haven't contributed, you have, a, you have another day to, to get a submission in. Um, but the idea is that come July, uh, you'll be able to spill over excess uh, renewable electricity uh, to the grid and get paid for it. Um, and that should drive a lot of rooftop solar, particularly in Ireland. Um, okay. It's interesting, when I was in college, it was fanciful that PV would be considered at all viable in uh, a country like Ireland, but here we are, the cost per kilowatt peak has plummeted uh, and it is viable. Um, so it's amazing, you know, when you take that 10, 20 year perspective, how things change, things have changed incredibly in the last 20 years. And there's every likelihood that they'll change just as incredibly, if not more so in the next 20. Okay. So um, the big thing this year, from our point of view, is to get the climate bill enacted and uh, so this sets out the plan uh, for the next 30 years, the governance for reducing carbon emissions in Ireland for the next few decades. Um, it sets into law for the first time this idea of carbon budgets. Uh, so the state will essentially allow itself to emit a certain amount of carbon in, in each five year period. Uh, and each five-year period is going to have a reduced amount of, of carbon allowed. And um, so th this is pretty big. Um, it's We're not the first to do this. They, they've done it in other countries, and it really will drive emissions down. Um, and uh, I think like the hope is that by 2030, well, it's government policy by 2030, that greater than 50% of 2018 emissions would be um reductions would be achieved uh, and then 
you know, then the next two decades we'll be getting rid of that, uh, that other 50% down to net zero by 2050. So there, there's a lot of mechanisms built into the bill to ensure that we stay on trajectory. And, um, uh, and it, this is going to be really challenging. Like the, the, bill, the bill is the governance, but um, it's going to put in place maximum carbon uh, allowances. Uh, and there's going to be a debate and an argument about which sectors should get more carbon and more allowances. And um, that's going to be quite interesting. We'll have to decide as a state which, uh, um, you know, where we can make the most gains, you know, how we do this without uh, impacting our economy too much, um, how we do it without, um, you know, uh, leaving people behind and, and ensuring energy security and, um, um, and all those, there's huge implications, obviously, you know, this, the challenge shouldn't be understated at all. Um, and as part of the climate bill, there is there will be climate climate action plans. So basically, a whole series of measures that will be required uh, to uh, get onto that trajectory. Uh, and there is a review mechanism built in so that if we go off track, then um, extra measures are brought in, then are added to the climate action plan to put us back on track. So. So that's the presentation. Um, thank you very much for your talk and very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I suppose also I'll take this opportunity to thank uh, Thomas and Sinead for, for all the work that they've done for today's uh, presentation as well. Um, it's great to see an engineer going down maybe a more unconventional path and, and being so successful there uh, with the idea of, of climate action at the core of of your work there uh climate breakdown is is arguably the greatest crisis of our time and it's great to see that there is the ambition there from the government to combat it and even though we have been left behind uh, we're trying to get to the front um we see with COVID 19 that's obviously a very serious issue at the moment um unlike COVID 19 there is no vaccine that can be um can be administered to tackle climate breakdown. Um, so it was very interesting to see the work that we are doing in the government um, to, to try and limit this, this matter. Um, coming up over the next uh, two, three months, uh, we've got a lot more presentations uh, within the sustainability uh, grand tour. Um, the dates are up there for some of the more interesting ones and we'd love if everyone could join us uh, at these uh, to do a plug in in a few weeks time we've got um, a local company Thermo King and Galway and SEAI Dennis Deneen from SEAI are going to do a presentation that's co-hosted between um, the West region that I'm the chairperson of and the um, Environment Energy and Climate Action Division uh, within Engineers Ireland. Um, so I hope you can come along to that and uh, thanks again Brian for presentation today and thank you everyone who took time over their evening uh, to join us and contributing to a very high quality Q&A session. Um, thanks very much and we'll see you again on the Sustainability uh, Grand Tour. Good evening.